In this video I'll be taking a look at the Vampire Curse factions, specifically the Drowned, to further explore the wonderful necromancy offered in Total War Warhammer 2. The Vampire Coast is a group of pirate-themed undead factions led by pirate vampire lords. They're the most technologically advanced undead faction in the game, and they make use of gunpowder weaponry, as well as having many water-themed undead monstrosities. There's four factions of the Vampire Coast available to play. The Awakened, which is led by Lufor Harkon. The Dreadfleet, which is led by Count Noctilus. The Pirates of Sartosa, led by Aronessa Saltspite, and the Drowned, led by Silostra Diophan. The Drowned will be the focus of this video because they're the faction I have the most experience with. I've also played a little of the Awakened, and they're a great faction as well. Just like the Vampire Counts, the Vampire Coast factions spread vampiric corruption. Unlike the Vampire Counts though, their armies do not take attrition in territory with low levels of vampiric corruption. This makes moving around the campaign map a bit easier. Another big difference between the Vampire Coast and Vampire Counts is that they can recruit on the fly. Armies can be told to encamp, which will stop all attrition and give bonuses to leadership and defense, while also giving access to local recruitment while at home and the more expensive global recruitment queue when abroad. The global recruitment queue offers all units that are producible anywhere within your empire but at an increased price and slower recruitment speed. Just like the Vampire Counts, battles fought on the campaign map leave behind battle sites, which you can use to recruit fresh units from, using the Raise Dead ability. One of the differences I noticed between the Vampire Counts and the Vampire Coast is that the Vampire Counts have this mechanic called the Dead Rise Again, which will occasionally cause units killed in battles to just get back up again after the battle has ended. This is good because if you're lucky, you can get most of your army back after suffering some heavy losses. The Vampire Coast factions do not have this ability. The undead that die stay dead. Another difference is that the Pirate Lords have the loyalty mechanic. Loyalty is a number between 1 and 10 that slowly decreases over time. The rate it decreases at is dependent upon the attributes of the individual pirate lord. For some it's very fast, while others lose loyalty slowly. High loyalty confers buffs to the lord, like reduced upkeep and recruitment costs, while low loyalty increases the upkeep and has other drawbacks associated with it. The biggest drawback is that a lord with low loyalty can desert, taking their entire army with them and forming a new pirate faction. To counter this, your lords have to be kept busy doing the things that they like. Be careful when you employ a pirate lord to make sure that you'll be able to keep them happy. Some of them like to sack settlements and raid provinces. These ones you have to keep busy raiding enemy territory. Others gain loyalty from recruiting units or performing ambushes or establishing pirate hideouts. For my playstyle, I avoid the pirate lords that want trickier things like ambushing and establishing pirate hideouts. I stick to the ones who enjoy defeating enemy armies, sacking settlements, raiding, that type of thing. These are easy for me to manage because I know that whenever they get a bee in their bonnet, I can send them off to war or whatever to stop them from rebelling. This loyalty mechanic makes defense difficult. Pirate lords must be kept busy and cannot be left alone in cities to defend. They'll start causing you problems which to be honest is exactly what you'd expect from pirates, so it makes a lot of sense. Keep your pirates busy and you'll have no issues. Just like the other undead factions, units never rout in battle and are also immune to fear. They always fight to the bitter end and if things are not going your way and your leaders lose their resolve, the entire army will begin to crumble to dust. All further discussion will be done with regard to the Drowned Faction, because this is the one I've got the most experience with. So let's take a look at the units available to this faction. For infantry, we've got Zombie Pirate Deckhands, who wield cutlasses. They're slow and clumsy, but actually pretty decent in combat. They make for superb meat shields, and they can hold the line against enemy infantry for quite a while. They shine the most in sieges, where they can use their cutlasses to great effect at clearing enemies off the battlements. The main problem they have 
This extends to all the zombie units that this faction has, is that they're very slow and not at all maneuverable. They also come in the form of spearmen with large harpoons, which are great against cavalry and large units like enemy monsters. There are also sirenes, which are ghostly women. They're very fast but also very strong, and are possibly the best melee infantry unit available. Unlike the zombies, they're very maneuverable and good at chasing enemies down. They're also good in a straight up fight, able to hold their own long after zombies would have perished. The elite infantry units for this faction are the Depth Guard. These are not zombies nor skeletons, but heavily armoured vampire soldiers. They move about as fast as living troops, but are not quite as mobile as the sirens. They come with axes or pole arms. Of all the vampire cursed units, these guys are the ones I've used the least. Not because they're bad, but more because zombies are cheaper, and I tend to make a lot more use of guns and artillery than melee troops. Which brings me to the missile infantry. By far the coolest thing about the Vampire Coast is its zombie gunmen. It really makes you feel like an undead Napoleon or something, commanding all these musketeers and artillery. The gun-wielding zombies are called zombie gunnery mobs, and the cheapest kind of gunmen you can get wield pistols. The pistols pack plenty of punch, but have a relatively short range. Enemy archers will outrange them by quite a bit, so beware of that. They can fire while walking, which gives them some limited ability to chase fleeing units and keep shooting at them as they pursue them. The problem is that the zombies run so damn slowly. Actually, run is the wrong word. They stumble and stagger and trip after the enemy, so slowly that they'll never catch them. The same speed problem also has meant that these zombie pistoliers make for poor skirmishes. They cannot run away from the advancing enemy fast enough to be effective skirmishes and their shorter range means that enemy archers can kite them easily. The good news is that the pistols pack a serious punch, much more of a punch than bows. For this reason, I like to use them as a cheaper form of musketeer, and mix them in with standard musketeers with full-size guns who cannot move while walking, but have increased range and firepower. The zombie gunnery mobs with full-size guns really do a shocking amount of damage to the enemy. You can concentrate so much fire on advancing infantry that their health gets halved within the first volley or two, and they begin to waver and retreat. The rate of fire on the zombie gunmen is also pretty good. The main drawback with them is again their extremely poor mobility. You'd better hope that those first few volleys knocks your enemy's senses, because once they get in range your poor musketeers are doomed. The good news is that the muskets really do inflict a shitload of damage. You can also focus fire on large enemies like dragons and bring those down pretty quickly too. But if pistols and muskets aren't enough, there's more zombies with even bigger guns available. The zombie hand cannoneers are anti-infantry specialists and they carry in large, barreled, yet short muscled cannons. These zombies have about the same range as pistols, but they shoot quite large projectiles that get shot out in pairs. I find the zombie cannoneers really good. While they lack the range of the musketeers, the volleys they unleash cause devastating damage, especially when shot into the flanks of enemies so they engage with zombie swordsmen or at point-blank range. They're also very effective at gunning down large monsters like dragons. But if that wasn't big enough, even bigger guns are available. The zombie deck gunners wield cannons that should be on a ship. Only the strength that comes of undeath allows them to wield such large weapons. These zombie deck gunners outrange even the musketeers, having a range of approaches but doesn't quite match that of artillery. They deal obscene amounts of damage, and do well against anything they can shoot at, be it infantry, archers, dragons, doesn't matter. But they also appear to be more fragile and engaged in melee combat than musketeers or hand cannons, so be sure to keep them out of harm's way. You also have the zombie grenadiers. These zombies hurl grenades at the enemy and have a range shorter than the pistol is, but nothing aside of artillery matches their destructive potential versus infantry. Any kind of densely packed enemy formation will incur heavy losses after being bombed by these guys, and they can cause enemy units to rout very quickly. Once engaged in melee combat, they struggle to throw their bombs though. I find them best used behind some zombie cutlasses. The cutlasses will engage the enemy and pin them, then the grenadiers will bomb the ever-loving shit out of them. 
The friendly fire incurred is of course off the charts, but zombie cutlasses are expendable. The grenades work well versus everything, but are least effective against large monsters and heroes. The grenadiers are also great in sieges. They can hurl their bombs up into the walls and quite literally blow the enemies off the battlements. Next up we have the artillery, which is one of the strongest things about the faction. Mortars shoot exploding and whistling projectiles at the enemy, and are really fantastic at killing densely packed infantry. Due to the incredible range on the artillery, they tend to soften the enemy up significantly before they ever come in range of the zombie gunners, and for sieges they're also great. You can choose to target enemy archers on the walls, or even blow the walls and towers apart if you wish. Because the mortars shoot in that tall yet narrow arc, they're able to hit enemies on the other side of hills, and are pretty good in strange terrain. The Caronada is your conventional cannon. It has a longer range than the mortars, and a much flatter trajectory. Its projectiles are cannonballs that travel very fast to the enemy, and do not explode on impact. Being cannonballs, they seem to roll a bit when landing, so they can rip a path right through an enemy formation. They do more damage than mortars, from what I can tell, but they're also more difficult to use on uneven terrain due to the flat trajectory. There's also the unique cannon called Queen Bess. She's a giant mortar and shoots a huge smoldering projectile at enemies that explodes an impact. Of all the artillery pieces, Queen Bess is the best one, and it usually takes no more than two hits before the enemy routes in terror. Finally we come to the monster and beast units. Bats are available just like in the Vampire Counts factions, but the Vampire Coast has some more variety. You can get deck dropper bats which carry zombies underneath them. The simplest form carries zombie pistoliers, but you can also get ones that carry musketeers or grenadiers. The grenade carrying ones are especially good because they function like bombers. You lose some firepower but you gain a lot of mobility. The bats are also good at spotting. If enemies are hiding in forests or behind hills, the bats can expose them so that the artillery can rain chaos upon them. A suicide unit available to the faction is the bloated corpse. This zombie is swollen and fat from the gases produced during decomposition, and it works like a suicide bomber. The fat man will charge in and leap onto enemies and then explode. The damage dealt by these guys is pretty extreme. A single bloated corpse can kill more than 100 enemies, and they move pretty quickly. The main downside to them is that if enemies shoot them down before they can close the distance, then they die without dealing any damage. They can also explode prematurely and kill your own troops, so keep them far away. The sea dogs are similar to the wolves of the vampire counts. They're good at pursuing fleeing enemies and killing them off. I don't use them much to be honest, because I find the bats better in general. One of my favourite monster units are these squid boys called animated hulks. They're basically ogres that have died at sea and then been reanimated to serve. These abominations have become fused with ship parts and horrors of the deep. They have large claws and tentacles, and anchors or cannons for arms. They're pretty much anti-infantry units. Use them to charge in and send enemy troops flying. They can also beat down gates and sieges if need be. The Mornghuls are insanely ugly, even by undead standards. Uglier than any undead I imagined, actually. Large and grotesque things with hanging jaws and no legs. They're a kind of monstrous infantry that can also hide in plain sight. You can spring traps with them, or just use them as a kind of shock trooper. Rotting Prometheans are huge crabs, hermit crabs I believe, that are almost like a strange hybrid between cavalry and monstrous infantry. They're pretty good, and also come in the form of zombie hand cannoneers riding on their backs. This makes them like a kind of missile cavalry almost. Don't take the cavalry comparison too seriously though, they're difficult to describe. They're slower than cavalry would be, but also a lot more potent in melee. So I think considering them as some kind of hybrid unit is most correct. The Necrofex Colossus is one of the coolest units available to the faction. It's a large golem made from a broken ship and also from corpses. It has long, hooked, tentacle-like fingers on one hand, and the other hand has multiple cannons. The cannons shoot like artillery, and also have the range of artillery. 
Zombies appear to be riding on the Colossus as well. Needless to say, it's a very strong unit. The other two monstrous units available are the Rotting Leviathan, which is a huge crab. It's probably the best melee unit available to the faction. It's tough as hell and sends enemy troops flying with every swipe. I don't have a single bad thing to say about it. Finally we have the Death Shriek Terrorgeist, which is a large undead worthen, which appears to be identical to the normal Terrorgeist available to the vampire cats, except for its greenish coloration. I may be wrong, and there could be more differences, but from what I can see, it's the same unit. The Terrorgeist is a great thing. I'll briefly cover the heroes, and then we can talk about the faction more generally. The heroes available are Gunnery Whites, Mongol Hunters, Vampire Fleet Captains, and a unique hero to the Drowned, I believe, the Damned Paladin. Gunnery Whites are pistol-wielding heroes that have abilities like throwing grenades at the enemy, enhancing the accuracy of nearby gunmen, and also providing more ammunition to units. This is especially useful for Queen Bess, because she chews through the ammunition really quickly. Mongol Hunters are monstrous combatants in the battlefield, and are also the assassins of the faction. They spread corruption on the campaign map, and can be used to assassinate enemy heroes. Vampire Fleet Captains are the faction's spellcasters. Some of them have the same spells as Vampire Count Vampires and Necromancer Heroes. They've got stuff like healing and death magic, but there's also a type of new magic school called the Deep. These spells are ocean themed, like causing a torrent of water to flood over your enemy, which damages and demoralizes them, or sending large whipping tentacles to grab enemies and slow them down. The Damned Paladin is a ghostly Bretonian knight and a very good hero in combat, but also great on the campaign map. He helps to boost public order. Silostra Deerfin is the leader of the Drowned, and she's like some fat frumpy opera singer whose boat sank. She decided she wasn't done singing yet, so she rose up and she wants to drown everyone's lungs with water and fill their ears with her music. She's honestly pretty funny. When she casts spells and fights in battle, she sings. Her coolest abilities is that she can summon ghostly Bretonian knights to the battlefield. These elite knights are very good and also the only conventional cavalry you can get. She also has access to the deep magic school and can summon rotten Prometheans to the battlefield. So the thing with the vampire coast is it appears to be relatively immobile on the battlefield and relies on its obscene amounts of firepower to win battles. Against living enemies, the gunmen and artillery do really well because of the constant barrage of fire, which seems to really demoralize the enemy. Enemies will usually rout under the wilting lead rain, sometimes before they even get close to a gunman. Soldiers that have had to hike a long way uphill, getting shot at by mortars and cannons all the way, will not fare well once the zombie musketeers begin to fire on them. If that doesn't make them run, then the zombie hand cannoneers surely will. As the last line of defense here of the zombie swordsmen and spearmen, you are usually capable of finishing off the heavily damaged enemies by the time they reach you. The biggest problem is when you're caught on bad terrain, or the enemy manages to outmaneuver you, or for whatever reason you cannot shoot enough lead into the enemy before they close on you. Against undead you have to change tactics though. Undead did not rout, so they'll just eat all the lead you fire into them, and although they'll be heavily damaged, your musketeers will then be in hand-to-hand -hand combat, which is a lost battle. I find against the undead, units like grenadiers, bloated corpses, and the various monstrous units do a lot better. Although you can still win with guns and artillery, the chance of losing is a bit higher. Overall, I really love the faction, and I think you will too. To play this, you need the Vampire Coast DLC. Thanks for watching. I hope this video has been informative. I've got more videos and necromancy stuff coming soon. By the way, there's currently a big sale going on on Steam for the Total War Warhammer franchise. I think it's 66% off, and all the DLCs have been halved in price, or at least reduced a bit. Now's a really good time to get into the game if you want to, because it's usually pretty expensive. The sale ends on the 23rd of April.